I'm Dr. David Jockers, and I run Exodus Health Center here in Kennesaw, Georgia, and I also have a, a big website called drjockers.com where I provide all different types of health information, recipes, um, health and nutrition programs, lifestyle programs. In my clinic, I work with people of all different types of demographics, people that are looking to, to reverse chronic disease, people that are looking to lose weight, um, people that are just looking for overall health and wellness. And so I provide chiropractic care as well as health coaching and functional nutrition. So I look at lab work and uh, specifically customized nutrition programs and supplement programs for people to really get to the underlying root cause of their health problem, affect it, and typically these root causes are, are related to chronic toxicities, so too much of things they don't need, and deficiencies, not enough of what they do need. So we look at the toxicity and the deficiencies, we address those and allow the natural state of health uh, to come back and see absolute life transformations. It's a beautiful thing. I wrote this article, Why I Don't Eat Pig Meat, because I get a lot of questions on my website about people asking for pork-based recipes and bacon and different things, different things like that. And so I really wanted to make it clear why I don't advocate eating pork and eating pig products. And really what it comes down to is that for me, my upbringing, my parents are, um, are messianic. And uh, so because of that, being raised in more of like a Jewish culture, I was taught that pork was an unclean, unkosher meat. And so I really, as I, as I started to develop and um, you know, kind of take on my own spiritual outlook, I really looked into the science behind that. And what I found was that pork actually is, is really a parasite-ridden animal and it carries a lot of toxicity. And so the overall benefits, the actual amount of vital nutrients that we find in pork is relatively low. And then it has a higher parasite toxin load. So when I think about it, it's really an inferior food source. So although, you know, as a Christian believer, I, I know that we are, uh, you know, God doesn't necessarily judge us by what we eat. And we're certainly, it's not a heaven or hell kind of, uh, kind of decision as far as consuming pork or shellfish or anything like that. However, I believe that God really gave us uh, principles and principles to, to help us thrive, not only survive, but really thrive in life. And uh, avoiding food like pork, I think, is something that will actually benefit most people. And I think that it's, it's, a, great, it's a great principle to follow because, again, pork is low in vital nutrients and, and very high in environmental toxins. That's just not something we want to put in our bodies. We look at a pig, and a pig is, is a scavenger. So it's going to go around, and it's going to eat almost everything. Everything on the ground, it's going to eat. They actually eat, believe it or not, this is, this is gross, but pigs will eat their own, right? So if there's a sick piglet, the actual adult pigs will, will, will kill it and eat it. And so they actually, they're, they're, they're carnivorous. And it's really the same thing with lobsters, with shrimp. I mean, shrimp are one of the most... Um, they're one of the most cannibalistic, and that was the term I actually needed. They're one of the most cannibalistic uh, creatures that are out there. So shrimp will eat their own, uh, pig will eat their own. And so that sort of a mentality in a sense, I think the food that we're eating has a certain spirit to it and a certain energy to it. And uh, so a cannibalistic sort of animal, that's going to bring about more of a selfish type of a, a personality. And I think that the food that we eat is going to in a sense, affect our spirit and affect kind of the way that we just view life and our emotional balance. And uh, so it's more of a selfishness. And on top of that, because they have a, a digestive system that moves very quick, in fact, we look at a cow and a cow's digestive system, it takes 24 hours. They have four stomachs. It takes 24 hours for them to fully digest food, whereas a pig, well, it'll get through their stomach and digestive system in four hours, which is just not enough time for the liver to really process and detoxify any sort of environmental chemicals that are in the food as well as parasites. And so pigs carry a very high parasite load. Um, and again, they're just scavenging along the ground and they're like a, they're like a living trash can. And that's the way we gotta look at it. So God definitely put them on the planet for a reason, but it's to scavenge and to clean up the environment and not for us to consume. And that's why he made it clear in the Bible that it's an unclean animal.
When I was looking at the science, I found a 2013 consumer report that discussed how 69% of raw pork samples were contaminated with a number of different bacteria and parasites, particularly very high in Arsenia enterocolitica, which is a really, really, uh, a really bad parasite to get. It causes a lot of GI stress, so gastrointestinal stress, diarrhea. I mean, a lot of reports of people die all over the world with this sort of infection. And so it's very, very hazardous. Also on top of that, you know, pigs are known to carry tapeworms, which believe it or not, very, very common. And, and once we get tapeworms in our system, they're very hard to eliminate. I work with a lot of clients using parasite protocols in order to help eliminate these things, but it's very challenging in order to do that. Parasites will, will reduce your immune system and put chronic stress on your body. A lot of these people with parasite infections, they don't sleep well at night because parasites stimulate stress hormones at night. Stress hormones go up, the individual doesn't sleep well. In fact, that's one of the signs that you may have a parasite is, you know, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, all of a sudden you're wired, right? And you just can't fall asleep. You struggle to fall asleep no matter how hard you try. That is actually a sign, right? That a, a well-versed clinician will say, hmm, possibly there could be a parasite playing a role here. And uh, pork is one of the biggest carriers of parasites. So, you know, we look at the science, it just shows that we've got all these parasites in the animal products. And now we can cook and we could try to really, really cook it at a high temperature to kill off as many of these parasites as possible. And that's definitely effective to a degree. But some of the parasites are actually so virulent, they're so resistant that they can survive even high heat. So, um, so an animal like pork, again, not a whole lot of vital nutrients that we can't get, really no vital nutrients that we can't get from other animals like lamb, grass-fed beef, um, consuming bison or, or wild game, wild caught fish. We get much more, a much greater nutrient value out of those animals, right? And consuming those than we would out of pork. And then with pork, we're also taking in a high risk for parasites and then other environmental chemicals and toxins as well. So going into more detail on cooking pork, you know, a lot of places, of course, you know, barbecue pork is really, really popular in America. But when we barbecue or we cook at a really, really high temperature, we actually cause a number of carcinogenic chemicals, particularly things like heterocyclic amines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And these uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PACHs, that's produced when we're, in a sense, when we're smoking the meat, right? So the smoke aspect produces these PACHs which uh, are known carcinogens, right? So they really increase our risk of developing cancer. And then heterocyclic amines, so whenever you've got blackened spots on your meat, that's a buildup of heterocyclic amines, which are basically proteins that have been broken down in a certain fashion, and they become really potent free radicals that cause a lot of oxidative stress and tissue damage in our body. So clearly we don't want that. And then also the, the carbohydrate in the muscle meat gets burned up and it produces something called acrylamide, which is another carcinogen. So you got three of the most potent carcinogens that you are actually producing when you barbecue something. So I'm not a big fan of barbecuing at a really high temperature, any sort of meat. Um, and so when we try to do that with pork, we're obviously gonna cause problems. So one of the major principles when it comes to nutrition in general is we wanna look for foods that have a high level of nutritional value and a low level of environmental toxins. So we wanna maximize nutrients, minimize toxins. That's extremely important principle for us to remember. You know, most people in America are running around thinking about calories and protein and, uh, and fat and different things like that. However, the best approach is say, you know what, I wanna put food that has the maximal amount of nutritional value and the minimal amount of toxins into our system. And when we start to consume food that has a lot of toxins, like what we're talking about here, pork and, and shellfish and different things like that, we're gonna end up causing an overburdened stress on our liver and our gastrointestinal system. And when we consume those toxins, they're gonna to cause a lot of overall stress on our body, which increases our risk of developing things like cancer, um, for women, menstrual problems, menopausal problems, infertility, extremely common with chronic toxicity. For men, issues like prostate cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Parkinson's, huge links to uh, 
pesticide consumption, right? And so when we look at, uh, at pigs, when pigs are fed a diet, because you can get pasture-raised pig meat, pasture-raised pork, which, which for all intents and purposes would be very low in pesticides. However, when you're looking at conventional pig meat, it is so full of pesticides, which again, very strong link with things like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease, very much related to an overload of toxicity. In the short term, so those are, are chronic diseases, in the short term, what do people experience when they're toxic? Oftentimes, they'll have things like chronic headaches and migraines, low energy, skin outbreaks like eczema and acne, uh, big bags under their eyes, uh, just in general, a, a lethargy and an overall tiredness and brain fog because toxins are just slowing down our entire system and causing just overburdening stress on our liver. So again, the more that we can look to maximize the nutrients we're consuming and minimize the toxins, the better off our health and our quality of life is gonna be. So when we look at shellfish, we've gotta remember is that these are our, our animals, our creatures that are, that are bottom dwellers. And we've got a couple different classes. We've got crustaceans, so that's gonna be your lobster, your shrimp, your clams, and you've got mollusks, and that's gonna be things like clams, mussels, uh, things that really don't move. You know, you look at mollusks, they don't move, they're not hunters, whereas like a lobster, in a sense, does move. So that's kind of the, the difference there. And where do we find them again? They're bottom dwellers. So what are they eating? They're eating dead, decaying carcasses. So you look at a lobster and it will go around and just find dead, decaying fish, dead, decaying uh, animals that are at the bottoms. And, and so really it's getting the sick animals typically. Typically your healthier fish, the way that they will, will, will die will be they'll be eaten by something else. This very sickly fish will float down to the bottom as they just kind of slowly die. And so they're the ones that are loaded with parasites and viruses and different things like that. So the lobster, the shrimp, these, the, these crustaceans, that's what they eat. And when we look at the mollusks, they're actually filtering the water. They're kind of the water filter in a sense. So all the environmental toxins that may be around, um, all the different things. And in our society, I mean, we, we burn fossil fuels. So fossil fuels, you end up with methyl mercury that gets in the water, that works its way into the food, uh, just into the food chain itself. And any animals, like anything that's eating, in a sense, uh, you know, dead fish, or uh, the, the further you work up the, the food chain, the higher heavy metal load you're gonna have. On top of that, we've got all different things like dioxins and PCBs and different pesticides. And what we know is that um, is that our shellfish tend to score very high with those. So in general, we want to reduce our consumption of those types of animals because again, their toxic load is going to be a lot higher than fish who are, are swimming around and eating algae. Like you look at, for example, salmon and their primary food is algae. When a, when a fish is eating algae, you're going to have a much lower toxic load. Algae has a lot of essential nutrients, including chlorophyll, which helps purify the blood, helps purify the body. So when a fish is consuming a lot of algae, they're gonna have a lower toxicity load than a shellfish that is consuming um, toxic, uh, obviously just like we talked about, they're, when they're consuming toxic products. So in the United States, we have a really big problem with food allergies and food sensitivities. And part of that's because the food that we eat and kind of our overall lifestyle has damaged our gut lining. And our gut lining is one cell wall thick. We want to look at it in a sense, almost like a cheesecloth. And nutrients pass through the small little pores in our gut. When we're eating foods and we're not really giving, us, giving ourselves the time to digest it properly, when we're eating poor quality foods, we end up in a sense almost tearing that cheesecloth and now large proteins cross into the bloodstream. So when we look at things like shellfish, the type of protein that we find in shellfish, it's called uh, tropomyosin. And uh, basically the tropomyosin is, is somewhat similar to what we find in things like, uh, like in, in a sense, actually it's, it's very similar to roach, to the to, to proteins that are in roaches and dust mites and different things like that. And so we're being exposed to that on a regular basis. And our body, when it feels threatened, is gonna create an immune response to that. And so shellfish have components in there that are gonna stimulate our immune system 
when we take in those proteins and when they're large and undigested in high amounts. So anybody that has a food allergy to it, it's a sign that they have leaky gut. Okay, and again, it's, it's one of those things that te- seems to trigger. In fact, we know six million Americans have a food allergy to shellfish and it's the number one food allergy that puts people in the hospital. So, very serious. So, the biblical principles were really about allowing the Hebrew people to survive in a hostile world and ultimately to thrive. And so God gave us principles that would help us to avoid infection. We know that infection is what killed more people in those days than anything else. And so when we look at some of the animals that God, God called unclean, we look at camels, for example. <clears throat> camels don't have sweat glands, just like pigs. And so camels and pigs are unable to effectively detoxify. So for humans and for other animals that are able to sweat, Perspiration is one of the best ways we detoxify, and and camels are unable to do that, and it gives them a survival advantage in the desert. However, and and that's one of the reasons why they're able to go long distances without water. However, they also accumulate a larger toxic load, meaning that they're not gonna be healthy for us. We look at a shark. A shark is very, obviously very high on the food chain. And so what does that mean? That means it's eating all kinds of other animals and carnivorous animals are gonna bioaccumulate a larger amount of toxins. So anything that's carnivorous, like a shark, like an eagle, where they're getting most of their calories from meat, that's not gonna be healthy for us. And so that's why we wanna avoid that. So that would also include things like cats, dogs. These are things that, again, uh, the Bible calls unclean, and in some cases calls uh, detestable, right? That we should, in a sense, uh, you know, create an emotional reaction to be like, whoa, we're not going to eat that. Partially because a lot of other cultures around the Hebrew people at the time the Bible was written were eating these things. And so I think God used that word detestable to, in a sense, give us an emotional reaction to where it wasn't like it was just neutral or, hey, like, it's not a good idea to eat this. But instead that it's, it is gross. It is, you should have a strong dislike for that. And I don't think that's because God hates shrimp, right? If you Google search, um, why, does, why, why are shrimp not kosher? There's these articles that talk about God hates shrimp and lobster. I don't think that's the case. I think God put them on the planet for a reason. They're trash cans. They have a very important, a very important role in cleaning the bottom of the ocean floor. And it's just the cycle of life. However, he gave his chosen people, his people, he told them they're, they're detestable because he wanted to give us a strong emotional reaction in regards to not consuming them so that way we could prevent any sort of possible infection due to the viral load, the parasite load, the environmental toxins that are present in these animals. Jesus' message was really about living life and life more abundantly. It was about living this victorious, abundant life. And one of the key aspects of living a victorious and abundant life is taking good care of our body. You know, I believe that our body is our temple. And we look in Romans, it talks about, in a sense, just not conforming to the patterns of this world. And what are the patterns of this world? It's when it comes to health and nutrition, The patterns of this world all revolve around going after what's easiest and most pleasing. We want food that that we can get quickly and that pleases our sensations in the moment. And in sense, you know, the the whole biblical message is about being disciplined, being committed, being faithful, being uh, persevering, uh, being sacrificial. And so the biblical principle, in a sense, is, is, is absolutely set apart from this kind of default mentality that we have when it comes to food where we're going after what's easiest and most pleasing. So I believe that Jesus' message, if we were to translate his idea of living life and life more abundantly, that translation into a nutritional perspective would be, hey, let's go after food that is gonna provide maximal nutrients, minimal toxicity. Also, when it comes to consuming animal products, I believe that he'd want us to choose animal products that were raised in a very healthy manner, in a sustainable manner. And we look at cows and we look at different animals. I mean, they should be free range. They should be living on pasture. They should be eating food that's genetically congruent for them. So like with cows, they should be eating grass. Um, With fish, they should be eating sea algae and not in a farm 
uh, being fed genetically modified corn and soy and different things like that. So we want to avoid feedlot animal products because those are animals that are being tortured, maimed, they're being fed food that's uh, causing chronic disease in their body, that's wearing them down, it's genetically incongruent, and man is doing that for a profit. And I believe that Jesus would look down on that and say, you know, that right there is an injustice. And my message stands against that. And my message stands for, let's take great care of the life that, 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 that God has put on the planet. Let's nurture it. Let's respect it. Let's show love and appreciation for it. And absolutely, some of those things can be used as high quality food for us to nourish our body. But let's make sure we raise it correctly. We kill it correctly. And uh, let's make sure that we, in a sense, we consume it with a sense of honor and respect for the animal, that, and, a, and a sense of gratitude and thankfulness for the animal giving up its life so that we can support our own bodies and our own needs. So I believe that that is, in my perspective, that's, that's a higher spiritual approach to doing something that we do every day, which is eating, and doing something that, that's vital for life, which is eating. And really a true spiritual walk, we want to in intertwine every aspect of our life. It shouldn't be compartmentalized into just, I have this faith that I live by, you know, that, that in a sense gives me a label as a Christian. It should intertwine into every aspect of our life. The way that we look at our environment, the way that we look at the food we're putting in our body, the way that we look at all of our relationships, that should, in a sense, there should be an aroma of spirituality and an aroma of Jesus that comes off of us that people can see, and it should have depth and meaning. And I think nutritional approaches really, really uh, stand out. And when you start to live this sort of life and you start making healthy choices and doing it not in a, not in a way where, um, where you're, you're necessarily trying to preach it or, um, or, or being dogmatic about it with the people around you, but instead that you're sharing that there's a higher purpose behind it and that there's a higher way of life, an abundant life that we can all live, that we can all access, but it takes conscious choices in order to do that. It takes discipline, it takes sacrifice, and it takes uh, just a, a depth of understanding where our food's coming from, uh, what our food is eating, so what the animals are eating, or you know, in a sense, where, where, the, where the food is, uh, is being raised, and just an overall appreciation and gratitude towards what we're putting in our body. So when we look at the science, what we know is that, in a sense, grass-fed animal products as opposed to grain-fed, grass-fed animal products have a lot more omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3s help reduce inflammation. They help support our brain, our cardiovascular system. They help uh, strengthen our immune system. They're, they're profoundly more beneficial. Also, grass-fed animal products are gonna have a lot more antioxidants in them. And so those antioxidants help reduce inflammation help improve overall neurology, help, uh, help to just overall strengthen our immune system, prevent against chronic disease development, and allow us to function and flourish in life. And we look at, in a sense, fish, fish that are feeding on algae particularly, particularly things like red algae, like salmon, and that's really where they get their astaxanthin, which is what gives them their pink color. That gives them incredible strength. I look at, like for example, wild-caught Pacific salmon, these fish actually swim upstream against the rapids and they can jump 10 to 20 feet out of the water. That's incredible strength. And what gives them the strength? It's the omega-3 fats, it's the astaxanthin. That's what we get in a wild-caught fish as opposed to in a sense of farm-caught, farm-raised fish. Um, clearly, eating animals, animal meat that is low in environmental toxins is gonna play a big role in our, in our ability to get uh, chronic disease later in life, our ability to flourish later in life. So there's a lot of studies talking about high consumption of animal products and the risk of heart disease, cancer, degenerative diseases. But really, when we look at those studies, they didn't differentiate between the difference between properly raised clean animal products and unclean animal products. And so it's my belief, based on the nutritional value of clean, organic, grass-fed, pasture-raised animal products, that the overall nutritional value and the low amount of toxins there is going to give us much greater survival advantage, a much lower risk of developing chronic disease, and a much higher risk of thriving 
in, throughout our life and then even into our older, age, our, our older years.